How y'all doing? Y'all good? It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Y'all dealing okay with the allergies? Man. Man. I'm going to start wearing a biochemical mask out here, man. It's tough for those of us who are allergy sufferers right now. You can see, you can see the stuff in the air, right? I don't think it's just pollen either. I like it. It's some other like biochemical warfare going on out there right now, man. It's really uncomfortable. March and April in Sacramento. Welcome. Um, listen, we're in a one-off today. The title of our message today is Church Rising. Church Rising, as in rising to the occasion. And we are in quite an occasion right now in the world. And we'll be walking through the passage in Exodus chapter 3 and chapter 4, so you can open up your Bible there, your U version, your device. And it's the famous call of Moses passage, which is lead up to the parting of the Red Sea passage. And all that is part of the history of the Israelites and their exodus out or their move out of Egyptian bondage and their trek into their future and their promises of God in the promised land. And that is what the word exodus actually means, as many of you are aware. It means to make a mass move. It means to make a mass departure. For the Israelites, this was the move in their history. As a body of God's people, they rose up and made the move up and out. The move out of bondage into liberation. The move out of current reality and into future destiny. And I talked about this with our uh, Elk Grovians a few weeks ago, our people at our Elk Grove campus. Um, depending on where you're from, the meaning of the expression, the move, is determined by your context, right? Like if you're from an urban context, when somebody says, what's the move? They're probably referring to plans for the evening tonight, right? What's the move? In other words, what's our strategic itinerary for the evening? What's, you know, what are we about to get into tonight, right? What's the move? Or sometimes it gets to be that time when you got to move up on out of the house, right? You have to make that move from living at home with the family to living on your own. And I don't know about you, but it seems like uh, that is happening later and later for young people now, right? Like I moved out when I was like 18, 19, you know, seems like now some of the kids are moving out a little more like 38, 39, <laughs> you know, they're trying to wait till it's that right time to drop that mixtape and get up on out of the house, you know, wait for that big break in the comedy club so they could tell jokes for a living on YouTube and become famous, right? Or, or how about this, if you know, you know somebody's about to change something relationally, right? They might be about to make that move, right? Make that move out of a relationship maybe. Or, or maybe they're interested in somebody and they're about ready to make that move, right? You, you might be talking about moving out of a bad relationship with that previous knucklehead you was with and processing through and preparing yourself so that you can move into a new healthy relationship down the road with a new guy, you know, who's got his future all planned out, and got his independence, and got his own place, and got a job, and some insurance, and <clears throat> knows how to cook, right? Got all his teeth, you know what I mean? <laughs> Moving from, from current reality to future <clears throat> destiny right there, right? Sacramento King's disastrous season is about to end. <laughs> and usually when the season ends, I'll, I'll talk with the guys on the team that I'm close to, and I'll ask them, you know, what's in store for next season? Like, as you approach the off season, what, what's the move, right? And I'll usually ask, what, what's the move that the Kings need to make? How, how are they going to improve? And usually they'll, they'll, <laughs> usually they'll look at me and go, we need a new chaplain. That's what that <laughs> Because if you call yourself praying for the team, Bob, like, <laughs> you ain't helping none, right? <laughs> but, but when they start to talk about the moves the kings need to make or, or the moves, you know, their agents want to make, like, usually those smaller personnel moves that are, teams are going to try to make are largely dependent on 
the move like a household name player is going to make, like, like, like a Kevin Durant or a LeBron James, right? The one big move happens, and then a bunch of other dominoes fall into place. As we're about to jump into the text, many of you know the story of Exodus 3 and 4. God meets up with Moses on the top of Mount Sinai, and after he talks Moses out of all of Moses' excuses, God sends Moses straight to Pharaoh, the new Pharaoh of Egypt, with one simple message, right? So Moses goes to Pharaoh with the gospel of Kevin Hart, right? He tells his Israelite friends, it's about to go down. And then he tells Pharaoh, God told me to tell you, right? And if you're laughing right now, you ain't as saved as you think you are because you're watching too many Kevin Hart videos. But he told Pharaoh, God told me to tell you to let my people go. I want my people to move out. I want my people to make the move. And when Moses did that, that was the beginning of Moses rising up as a leader and the people of God rising up to the occasion as a people collectively moving from current reality to future destiny. And that's our focus today, rising to the occasion. God's plan for his people has always been to get them out of something, through something, to something. That's been the plan of God from the beginning. And it doesn't matter if we're talking about an individual or a group of people. God's plan is always to take his people out of something, through something, to something. Out of confusion and depression or out of darkness, out of bondage through something, through difficulty, through challenge, through trial, through development, through the wilderness, to something, to your dream, to your destiny, to your purpose, to your promised land. That's always God's process. And it always takes people to rise up to make that happen. And the best people God can use to escort others through that process is people that he's already done that for. And some of y'all come in here looking all churchy and all Jesus-y, but a few of you know what it looks like to have God bring you up out of something. Amen. Other people can't always tell what God brought you out of because we have these little censored little testimonies. But if we're keeping it completely gangster in here right now, somebody in here knows what I'm talking about. And they're saying, I can't tell you what it was. I can't tell you exactly when he did it or where he did it. But it was only God that could have brought me out of that thing. Amen. And I know it was only God that brought me out of that thing because I was actually enjoying that thing. But it would have killed me if he didn't bring me out of it. Amen. And when you're going through the process, God wants you to have hope when you're being pulled out. God wants you to have healing as you're being pulled through. And God wants you to have health when you get to your promised land. Out, through, and to. Thank you, Lord. And during those things, hope, health, and healing. And God's earthly mediators to escort people out through and to are the individuals of his church and his individual churches. God uses his people and his churches to rise up during difficult seasons in the world to bring people out through and to. So we're going to jump into our outline if you're keeping score. As a local church, as a local body of Christ, us collectively, we rise to the occasion by being one in your outline, a community of rising stories. We're a bunch of individual stories and collectively we make a rising story. Let me read to you Exodus 4, 1 through 5. You ready for this? Y'all ain't ready for this. <laughs> Moses answered, what if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you? So Moses is still tripping. God is asking Moses to rise up and Moses is still making excuses. Then the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? A staff, he replied. The Lord said, throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake and he ran from it. How many of you say I'm running with Moses too? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then the Lord said to him, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. 
So Moses reached out and took hold of the snake and turned back into a staff in his hand. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has appeared to you. So we're at this scene in which God is attempting to talk Moses into fulfilling his call and the one to be the person to lead the people out of bondage through the wilderness into the promised land. The story's already been written by God. Moses just doesn't want to live into the story that's written for him. And as Moses continues to run from his call, God says, what do you have in your hand? And Moses says, it's just, it's just a little trash, little stick. And God says, that's right. Now throw your little garbage little stick down on the ground, right? And your Bible says when Moses did that, the stick became supernatural. It became sensational. It actually turned into a snake. And God must have known something different about Moses because the Bible says that Moses ran from it. I would have ran and never turned back around. I'd have just been gone, right? And God said, Moses must have ran and stopped because God said, get back over here and pick up the snake. You and I would have been long gone, but Moses was right there, picked up the snake, and God says, reach down, pick it up by the tail. Now, I, I'm never around snakes long enough to be an expert, expert but I, I know enough about them to know if you're crazy enough to pick a snake up, you pick it up near the head so you control the dangerous part, right? But God says, pick it up by the tail. God says, you pick up the non-dangerous part of the load and I'll take care of the difficult part of the load. You pick up the part you can handle, I'll take care of the part you can't handle. 99 times out of 100, when God's going to do something amazing through his people, God is going to make you confront your greatest fears. 99 times out of 100, y'all. As God is using you and your little trash stick or whatever it is to do something sensational, he wants you and I to go through the process of healing. And that might be some emotional healing. That might be some physical healing. It might be some relational healing. But, but as he's using you to create an amazing story and maybe bring some others out through and to, he's doing something inside you and with you at the same time. And that's what some of you are missing out on by not serving in the local body. God can't do something in you in that way. Some of you heard me use this analogy, but it's so fitting. When Moses is attempting to get out of his call, he was using every excuse in the book. And all of his excuses were so self-absorbed, so self-consumed, just like us with our shortcomings and our fears that we use as excuses not to serve. When, when God called Moses, Moses said, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? In other words, God, you want me to go? God, are you crazy? God, you seen my credit score? American Express just canceled my car, God. You know that. And God, you know, you know my driver's license is suspended. My vehicle registration ain't paid. My tag's all late. It's from 2020. You can't be asking me, God, right? I'm not on a ministry team, God. I'm on the comfort team, right? I don't do anything that gets me out of my comfort zone, God. So while Moses is wilding out, God's response in Exodus 3.12, Moses, certainly I'll be with you. <clears throat> God didn't say anything about Moses' shortcomings. He just said, Moses, certainly I'm going to be with you. And that's all you need, Moses. You don't need to be qualified. I'm qualified. And you're with me. You're good. Moses, I know you really ain't nobody. Who are you, Moses? Nobody, but I'm somebody, and I'm with you. And because of that, you are somebody, amen? <laughs> Moses, you don't have any excuses about who you are. This ain't even about you, Moses. Yes, you have all those shortcomings, but I'm trying to use you to move two million people out of slavery into their future reality, out of Egypt, <clears throat> through the wilderness to Canaan. 
And I'm going to do that by using you in the lead and I'll heal some of your junk while I'm doing it. Because I can do multiple things at the same time, Moses. I'm God. Matter of fact, when you ask me who I am, I said, I am. <clears throat> I just am. I am is the Hebrew word for the one that was, the one that is, and the one that forever will be. I'm the one that was while I pulled you out, the one that is while you're going through, the one that will be when you get to your future destiny. That's me. I'm God, yesterday, today, and forever. We rise to the occasion by being a church of healing. And collectively, we become a church of healing by allowing God to use us to bring healing to others. And while we bring healing to others, we get to confront and overcome our bad habits, our hurts, our hangups, our fears as well. We rise to the occasion, number two, by being a community of rising souls. A community of rising souls, rising to the occasion, six and seven. Y'all with me? Then the Lord said, put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand into his cloak, and when he took it out, the skin was leprous. It had become as white as snow. Now put it back into your cloak, he said. So Moses put his hand back into his cloak, and when he took it out, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. So Moses still hasn't accepted God's call, even though God's been speaking to him from a burning bush for a chapter and a half. <laughs> He just turned a rod into a cobra. So God is recognizing that Moses is a stubborn one. He's a fearful one. He's an unconfident one. He's an insecure one. He's a confused one. He might be a little lazy one. He might even be a little narcissistic one. So God has something else up his sleeve. And God tells Moses to put his hand in his cloak in this translation. Some translations say robe. Some say coat, some say shirt, some say put your, robe, put your hand in your robe on your chest, some say, many say bosom, and if you look at the Hebrew closely, you run it through a fine tooth comb, it's probably even something a little more like Moses put your hand on your heart and reach into your soul. God's saying something more like, reach inside yourself, Moses. And then he tells him to pull out his hand. And when Moses pulls out his hand, he has the worst form of leprosy known to mankind. And God is making the point with Moses that if you could look at what's inside of you, if you could look at your soul right now, I know you can't, but if you could, it would look as sick as that leprous hand you just pulled out. God's saying to Moses, Moses, you not wanting to fulfill your call, you, you not wanting to serve the people, you hesitating to move out of your current lousy reality, which is in bondage, your reticence to go through the process and development and journey towards your future destiny and call is a sign of something more unhealthy inside you than that ugly hand you just pulled out. Amen? And then God says, Put your hand back on your heart. Put your hand back inside your soul and reach back into your soul and then bring your hand back out. And Moses does and immediately his hand is completely healed. And God is showing Moses that not only does God have the power to heal our physical wounds, but he has the power to heal our mental, emotional wounds and what's inside of us as well. He can heal that. And we rise to the occasion by being a church of health, healthy people. Rising up to bring health to the community. Collectively, God's saying to all his people, you're not going to be able to rise up to the occasion and make the impact on this world we're living in that definitely needs a high impact church to rise up and make a difference if you don't get mentally, emotionally, and spiritually healthy. Take your mental and spiritual and emotional health serious, y'all. In our culture, it's crazy that mental and emotional counseling is still frowned on in many of our communities. It is crazy 
We are in 2022. And amazingly, that's still somewhat taboo. We don't like talking about our stuff. But let me, let me affirm you guys. It's okay. A, the fact that you're a little uncomfortable talking about what's troubling you. And B, the fact that you're struggling. It's okay. Can I just affirm you right now? It's all right. You, first of all, let me tell you this. You are way more normal than you think you are. If, if you struggle with anxiety, you struggle with panic, you struggle with social phobias, you struggle with depression, you, you struggle with occasional feelings of hopelessness, despair, or anything like those, let me tell you something. I think it's more weird not to struggle with those than it is to struggle with those. If you struggle with some of that, you're doing fine. You're okay. If you're doing deep yoga breaths at work just to get through the day, that's cool. Everyone is struggling. If you're downloading meditation apps to add to your prayer life, that's cool. That's cool. That's a good add-on to your prayer life. Do it. We're, we're all battling through all this craziness, y'all. Stop paying attention to all those fools on Instagram and, and their posts by people who are saying things like, are you living your best life now every single day, 24-7? No, we ain't. I don't care what Oprah's Instagram page says. I don't care what The Rock's Instagram page says. If all of the stuff you're struggling with is making you a little tired and a little lethargic, it's okay. It's normal. Yeah, you can clap for that. It's normal. <laughs> Stress causes fatigue, y'all. You don't need a Red Bull. You don't need a five-hour energy drink. You need a nap, <laughs> and that's cool. It's okay if you're fatigued. Everybody is. Like we talked about at the beginning, it's April in Sacramento, y'all. This is one of the worst pollen areas on the planet. The pollen count is off the Richter scale. Everyone's Claritin D to blood ratio is out of whack right now. It's okay that you're tired. You know, side note, in some stores, this ain't got nothing to do with anything. If you go to purchase Claritin D... In some stores, they make you sign a waiver that says you won't use it to sell meth. <laughs> Is that crazy? And I just feel like if you're a person who's into selling meth, that waiver probably ain't going to stop you. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Am I right about that? Like, is there, <laughs> is there some, like, meth dealer who's going to jail because he lied to the salesperson at Walgreens? <laughs> Nicole said you lied on that waiver. <laughs> Y'all, there is a way to improve your spiritual, emotional, and mental health. Make an appointment to see a counselor. We have a ton of great ones. It's healthy for you. We have many of them connected. That's also the reason why we're connected to Cheat Code and Dr. Armando Gonzalez. That's why we're building all these coaches up and developing them. It's for you and for our community. Make an appointment to see one of the pastors here. You probably need to hear some wisdom sometimes. And you probably need some help and assist making difficult decisions sometimes. That's okay. Don't be embarrassed about that. We all do. Are y'all with me? Yes. Man, y'all are tough. <laughs> all right, here we go. Number three, a community. We become a community of rising voices. Exodus 4, 10 through 12 says, Moses said to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been. He's still tripping, you guys. 
still doesn't want to serve. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. The Lord said to him, who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord said? I know about your problems. I made you that way, Moses. Now go and I'll help you speak and we'll teach you what to say. God says to Moses, let me fill you in with hope right now. I got you. I am with you. Some of you have heard me tell this one before. I'm sorry. Forgive me. It's just like so because I'm here a lot and thank God just sorry, a side note. Don't tell nobody. I'm glad the season's over for the Kings. I'm a little tired at this point. Okay. But when I go there, they help me out. They, they do one thing to help me out. They give me this lanyard, this badge, right? And that badge, it lets me walk around the arena without security bothering me. It gets me into secured areas where only secured credentialed people go. Otherwise, I'd be stopping. It'd take me two hours to do what I got to do, right? Because I got to come back here. But the thing about that thing is, like, I'd be abusing that badge, Okay. <laughs> I'd be walking into every room everywhere, you know what I mean? Saying, hey, hey. So, so anyway, but, but so when I go through, I go through security. You got your badge on. Some of them know me. They just let me through. But occasionally I'll bring somebody. If somebody's with me, you know, I'll go through. But then they'll stop them. Hey, where are you going? Because they're not secure. They're not credential, right? And I'll just real smooth go. Oh, he with me. He with me. <laughs> and I'll keep walking, right? And yeah, I ain't gonna lie to you, he gets good to you, right? You know what I mean? Because you get a little more swag when it happens, right? You're just like, yeah, he's, he's with me, he's with me. You know what I mean? You got your flow going, right? But, but, but then they'll let the person through, right? Not because they're credentialed, not because they're qualified, they let him through, why? Because he's with me. Same thing with God. I ain't no good, I can't be a pastor, I'm with him, I'm with him. Right? I can't serve in children's ministry. I ain't no good. Children don't even want me in there. Ah, but I'm with him. I'm good. Y'all feel me? Moses, you're with me. You agree to rise to the occasion, Moses, and I'm going to walk down this road with you. And as a body of believers, collectively, we rise to the occasion by being a church of hope. A church that provides hope to its people and to its region. I don't know about y'all. Our community seems like it's disintegrating. Our city seems like it's bubbling up with anger. I mean, people are going to nightclubs and getting angry and filing out of the nightclub so hostile that they're getting into shootouts. 16 people shot, six dead, coming out of a nightclub, a party place. Man, that's heartbreaking to hear. Man, because I have to tell y'all, I'm always honest with y'all. <clears throat> when this pastor was in his 20s, I went to the nightclubs. I haven't always been a pastor, y'all. <laughs> Wasn't always married, y'all. When I was in my 20s, you know, we worked all week. And then Friday came and you needed a release. You need to go out and do stuff. We went to the nightclubs. We were the happiest people on earth in the nightclub. When I was in my 20s, a nightclub was like Disneyland for kids, for 20-year-olds. And yes, that completely, you know, that completely stopped when you turned 30, right? It's over with, right? We, we, you know, we got 30 and Letty and I, occasionally we go to a nightclub as a favor to a friend or something. You know what I mean? And, and you know, you know you was too old. You know you're too old when, when you, you, you walk into the nightclub, right? And you're like, yeah, this is cool, right? And it's almost immediately like, is it loud in here? <laughs> Over. You're done. You're done. What you doing in a nightclub at that point? You're done. Get up out of here. But going backwards, we have people getting killed coming out of the nightclub. We have an unhoused community that's growing and they're getting angry and they're causing harm. We have people in the city that live in the city that own businesses in the city that are angry 
with the angry unhoused community. They're angry at us for helping the unhoused community. We have our minority communities that have felt like they've been locked out of economic opportunities and the best that education has to offer for decades, and they're angry. We have our wealthier communities that are getting angry about all of the anger that they see directed at them. Those of us on this side of the world are beside ourselves about the war that's going on on the other side of the world. We're heartbroken. Everybody in our world is upset. Everybody in our world is hostile. Everybody in our world is mad. And I believe to change that, God needs to upset your world. We can't change our disintegrating, separated world, our angry, wounded city, until we get angry like Jesus over how busted up everything is. And then we'll want to do something about it. Our city needs some hope right now, y'all. Our city needs a church like ours to rise up to the occasion right now and provide some hope and some comfort and some help and some health to a community that desperately needs it, y'all. And you know what? The people of the church only become a healthy community of rising voices who rise to the occasion when Jesus is both Savior and Lord. That's the only time. Believing, you guys, believing and receiving what Jesus has isn't enough. You need submission and surrender also. And to be honest with you, I see a lot of people in church, I see a lot of people at our church who believe Jesus is their savior, but I only see a fraction of those people who see Jesus as their Lord. Seeing Jesus as Lord means completely submitting and surrendering to the way he wants you to live. Living the way he wants you to live. Using your time for his purposes also. Using your finances for his purposes also. Using your gifts for his purposes also. Using your testimony in life for his purposes also. I see that in about, I don't know, 20 to 25% of our people. The other 75%, I think you love Jesus as Savior, you, you love the get out of jail free card that you get by believing he's Savior, but not as Lord. 75% of our people are still building their own kingdom and not Jesus. And for most of you that are still living in that Savior but not Lord space, it's probably because you aren't angry enough about the world that's breaking apart. Well, we're going to give you a chance to get so upset about something that you rise up to do something about it. We're going to give you a chance today, and we're going to give you chances over the course of the next five or six weeks. And there will be more opportunities to rise up and make a difference. But our, our very own Pastor Irene, you guys know Pastor Irene, she was born in the Ukraine. She has family there right now who are in danger, who are in need, who are in transition, and or all of the above. And we have a few ways that we can make a difference right now. So if you don't mind, listen to Pastor Irene on this video real quick. Midtown, it has been so sweet to be loved and cared by you during one of the toughest seasons I can imagine. Your love as, your, as my church, your love as a people of God has undergirded me and supported me, and I want to thank you so much. Your love has covered me, your prayers have covered me, and your compassion has helped me heal in my mourning and my grief. My family has been displaced, dispersed, and put in danger with this war in Ukraine, as most of them are there. And every day brings a new curveball and an uncertainty. And I want to let you know that keep praying. Your prayers mean so much. When we think about hope and our hope line in, in the eternity, in the eternal, your prayers are what continue to spur that on. So as a church rising, 
we place our hope in Jesus. I'm so blessed that many of my family, I would say almost most, are all believers. And when I speak with them, when we mourn together, when we grieve together, they even take a moment to say, of course I'm mourning what my reality is. I'm grieved over what I'm witnessing. I'm scared, but my hope is still in God because I know I know where it lies. I know who He is. And I know that eternity is real. And that is strong, y'all, to be able to say that in the midst of a war. Let's support them more. We're going to organize and support people in Ukraine, four organizations that are organizing still and have boots on the ground. They're still able to be people who are active and moving from supplies, food, whatever people need. People are organizing, whether they're in hiding or people are organizing, getting to towns that have had electricity out, whatever their resources are, but there's ways in to support one another. It has been remarkable to see how people have loved well. So we have two churches, one in Krivaroch and one in Hirson, where my family is connected. And they're going to be able to use the money we send to organize and continue meeting the needs of the people. We also have an organization called Open Arms Ukraine in Sumi, Ukraine. They're going to be working with teenagers and they could use more support with supplies just to make sure people are able to have shelter and food. And we also are working with Young Life in Ukraine. They have a base there and they have people working and loving people well. We're also going to partner with World Relief here in Sacramento. We want to support them as they continue to resettle and transition current refugees that have still been coming from Afghanistan. And then we want to help them with our donations to prepare for upcoming refugees coming from the Ukraine. So as you can see, we want to be intentional with how we tangibly love. That is how you're going to get to spread hope as the local church. From our local church to the local church in Ukraine, we get to be vehicles of God's hope. Because y'all, we know where our hope lies. And we know as transformed people, we don't give up. Just like my family in Ukraine is not giving up and their hope lies deep. Your hope and your prayers and compassion lies deep too. So as we give tangibly today, you can give digitally on our website. Just follow the links. You can give on your way out the doors if you're sitting in service today. Either way, as you give, we want to go far and love the people of Ukraine well. We continue to pray and then we tangibly act. Amen? Amen. Let's keep doing that. Let's give it up for Pastor Irene. She's got, you know, real skin in the game, and so do we. Um, you guys got to be honest with you. Like, the only way to get over the hump on some of this stuff that, you know, Jesus is Lord stuff, is to just break through. Like, for example, the only way to, you know, get over the hump is, yeah, you know, I, I don't really want to serve. I, I come, and you know what I mean? I, but I don't really want to serve. The only way to, to get over the hump on that is to just start serving. That's the only way. It's just to break through, start serving, and watch and see how God is doing something to you and in you. The only way to get through that, that, that barrier is going, you know, you know what, I come to church, but I don't give, which is a lot of us is just to write a check. It's the only way to break, you know, through on greed and through on reticence and being generous. And so we're going to give you the opportunity to, uh, you know, usually when we take the offering, offering or a lot of times we take the offering and say, you know what, if you're brand new, you know, don't give. On this one, I'll, I'll, all y'all, I don't care if you're brand new, let's give and help out what's going on to the people over on the other side of the world right now. And that'll help you spur you on. Because to be honest with you, again, like we'll never really break through and rise up the way we need to rise up unless some of you start to participate. It's really going to take all of us to share in the volunteer burden, in the financial burden. You know, many times you come to church and you're like, ah, you know, I didn't really take anything. What about all the people that served you? There's a bunch of people back there doing multimedia and sound. There's a bunch of people taking care of children right now. There's a bunch of people, greeters and ushers, people out front, people set up today. Oh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not really, I'm not really costing the church anything. You sitting in the, 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 this, this place right here, this costs money. The, the air conditioning is on right now. Can you hear it? <laughs> you, you, you getting the benefit of that little, it'd be 102 in here if it wasn't for the air conditioning. Yeah, yeah. What, what about, what about Pastor Irene? Our, Pastor Irene, that woman deserves a salary. Amen. Amen. 
So for, those, for those of you who don't give to the church, you're basically saying Irene don't deserve a salary. She, she don't help us. She helps y'all out in more ways than you can think. And so do the other people. And I don't even care. I don't even care if you give and you go, you know what? I'm going to write this check. Put down on there. I don't want Pastor Bob to get none of it. <laughs> Put it down. Our CFO, Dave Hansen, is right here. He'll make sure I don't get a dime of that. <laughs> we got to bust through on this, you guys. Let's pray. Bow in reverence. Dear Heavenly Father, I got to close, so I'm just going to be brief. And I just want everyone to know as they walk out, as they look to their left behind the curtain, our prayer team is over there. Two things today. One, we got to break through and we got to be a part of the solution. We got to rise up individually for us to rise up collectively. We got to believe that Jesus is Savior and Lord. And the second thing is, man, we don't like talking about our stuff. We don't like talking about our anxiety, our depression, our despair. It's okay to do that. Matter of fact, if you need prayer right now, form a line. We want to pray with you. We want to get you to a counselor. We want to get you in front of a pastor. We want to walk with you. It's okay that you're struggling. We all are. <clears throat> Lord, heal us. In Jesus' name, God's people said. God bless you guys. I hope this was helpful to you. We'll see you here next week. God bless. God bless.